This panel is going to address a topic that people are finding more and more important these days. If you've been watching the news at all, you're aware of the fact that a few of our social uh, media pro companies are struggling with uh, data privacy and uh, issues around hacking and uh, the availability of information. Uh, ethics in business has become a big topic in all kinds of business. But it's not a new topic for virtual reality or what we now call XR because augmented reality is so important as well. And so today we're going to dig in a little bit onto some of the concepts that we need to think about uh, involving the ethics of these technologies. And as I said, this is not a new conversation. In, in, in the mid-90s, there were, were, were books published on the philosophy of virtual worlds and what was okay to happen and what wasn't and what you would be able to do on things like if somebody steals my virtual property, is it a real crime? If somebody gets killed in a virtual world, is that a problem? But these are the kind of issues that have been around for a long time and now with the spread of, of ubiquitous computing and communications, they're only bigger issues. And so I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation. Let me introduce to our esteemed panelists. To my left is Selma Sabera, Sabera of Meow Wolf. Hello. Uh, they're doing great work. And I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves. I'm just going to tell you who they are. We've got Jesse Martinez of the Latino Startup Alliance, based in San Francisco. Robin Rosenberg a psychologist and the CEO of Live In Their World, and Josh Lovejoy, principal designer from Microsoft. So Selma, could you lead us off and tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Meow Wolf, and then we'll go down the line and then we'll start talking about the topic itself. Yeah, certainly. Hi, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Selma Sabera. I'm the executive producer for Cross Reality at Meow Wolf. Um, Meow Wolf is a B corporation uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, so we do uh, spend a lot of time thinking about uh, social impact that our uh, company has within our community and how to elevate the arts community and kind of break down some of the barriers that e exist inside that community. Um, and looking forward, uh, kind of into the future and, and designing exhibits that have a digital layer to them like mixed reality, we are facing some new challenges. So what Ben has kind of um, opened up as a discussion, we'll probably, we'll come back around to it today. So, hi, Jesse. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Thanks to Ben, thanks to AWE and also the Virtual World Society. Uh, my name is Jesse Martinez, and I'm the co-founder for Latino Startup Alliance. I started as a nonprofit, uh, actually as a meetup group back in 2011 with six people in the Mission District, and our whole mission is to empower Latino tech founders. Fast forward, we've grown to, to become a nonprofit. We're over 1,000 members globally, but at the same mission. And so I do a lot of work with uh, founders that are working in tech, and then more importantly, thinking about new technologies that our founders are working with, and then also thinking about the technologies and how they affect our communities. And then lastly, how do we create more creators in the mixed reality space as well, and ensuring that we have that diverse lens present at the table. Thank you. Cool. Uh, and again, thanks for having me here, um, and to Linda Jacobson as well. Um, my company, Live In Their World, uses virtual reality to address issues of bias and incivility. We, in the workplace, we marry the emotional impact and the emotional learning of VR with cognitive learning on our website, because as we know, VR is a great empathy machine. I'm really looking forward to the conversation because um, there's a lot we know from psychological research about VR and how the brain responds, and that has all kinds of interesting ethical issues. So that's, that's me. I'm Josh Lovejoy. Uh, I lead design for a group called Ethics and Society at Microsoft, uh, which is uh, housed within a product organization that focuses on AI, mixed reality, machine perception. Uh, what we do is we partner, uh, we have a multidisciplinary team that partners with the product groups well ahead of when they go out to market. 
Um, and so we co-create and figure out like what are some of the some of the deep issues we want to spend more time thinking about, uh, and how we can influence the the shape of the product policy, governance strategies, all sorts of good stuff. Great, thank you all. Do we have the uh, graphic? Can you throw the graphic up on the slide on the screen? I hope we have it. Uh, Kent Bai, who you all may know and, and perhaps have heard uh, talk at the conference, was working in Europe, I believe at Laval Virtual, where they had an ethics workshop, and they developed quite a nice graphic, um, which I thought we were going to be able to show you. Um, but while we wait for that, uh, why don't we start uh, with you, Je uh, Josh. Could you talk to us, tell us a little bit more about how Microsoft looks at ethics and, and uh, and, and you know all the issues about uh, decision making and, and how you evaluate products and, and so on. What, what, what's your day to day work look like? It's a super small subject. So yeah, right. Just straightforward. Um, you got three minutes. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna nail it all. Uh, I think what we have started out with is the is the collective recognition that we're running an experiment. Um, we know that there are a few attributes of this experiment that uh, we don't think have been done before. Um, and, and then we just kind of lean into this kind of growth mindset of how we, how we can learn by doing. Um, so attributes of the experiment that we feel really strongly about. Uh, like I said, we're a multidisciplinary group. So uh, there's a team of designers that I work very closely with, a, a user research team. We have ethicists, uh, computer scientists, uh, PMs, um, and uh, data scientists, and so we all come together because we have to kind of craft a, a bespoke approach to the unique needs of a given project. Um, whether it's doing something that relates to you know, military technology or medicine or consumer or productivity, um, they all kind of demand a different set of questions. Um, and so what we do is we start with that kind of learner's mindset and we work with, uh, we, we get the various uh, sort of responsible individuals together um, and, and have a cross-functional kickoff where we try to understand the nature of the project and what their intents are, um, try to like suss out a number of the assumptions that often go into a, what I would say is a very optimistic lens that most tech starts with. And we embrace that very optimistic lens, but then also understand that the pace of production and the pace of sort of like tech disruption um, often leaves us wanting more time um, and so we live in that space and say, what are the things that we want to spend more time thinking about? We graduate from that to talk about questions, key questions we all share. And so it's all about creating more shared space. When you start out as an ethics team, somebody might misrepresent you as a compliance group or as some sort of team that's going to say no a bunch. And so we try to, again, work together and say, no, actually our job is to co-create. Our job is to figure out if we should go out, how we should go out, um, and find that avenue for, for a responsible and a sustainable approach. Um, and then there's a bunch of different techniques and frameworks that we've been developing in real time. I'm happy to talk more about, but um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of just like how we um, lead by proving what's, what's possible and proving where there are repeatable practices and then how we can scale that out so that more folks can, can dive in. I know that's a little abstract, but. That's no, great. Selma, you, when we were talking before the conference, you told me that everything Meow Wolf does is looked at through an ethical lens. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, certainly. Uh, again, we are a, a B corporation, so uh, we put a lot of um, thought and outreach, actually, um, into the communities that we are in. Um, to understand how the artist thinks, how we are influencing that community, coming into that space, and, and how we, as an organization that is profitable um, and that wants to disrupt the art scene and engage with artists on a new and different level, how, how do we do that and how do we uh, provide the support that those artists need within those communities. Each community is very different, so we have to spend a lot of time listening. Uh, when we entered the Denver market, uh, 
with our uh, project. We did get a lot of backlash from the artist community that felt that we were invading the Denver space. And we spent a lot of time uh, talking to the artists and really trying to understand what's important to them and then how to pr create a space uh, where we can co-create with them uh, and carve out about 40% of that exhibit for the local artists in that community. So it's very important to us how we engage w w with folks um, in the states we're in or that we are coming to. Uh, it's also very important to us for each one of those communities to uh, write a corporate social responsibility plan towards that community and how we engage with them. Uh, and also as we bring new technologies because we are playing with a lot of new technologies that we don't know how the mass public is going to utilize, uh, especially when they come and visit. Uh, we try to gather as much data and have those conversations even when they're maybe sometimes uncomfortable. Do you, uh, have you ever had a situation where you've told an artist that their work was inappropriate or, or not acceptable for some reason of the con do, because of the content? Uh, we do have guidelines around the content. We are uh, an attraction for a lot of families, so we do stay away from content that has uh, high, uh, high violence value or other age inappropriate or graphic value. We do like to believe we're all inclusive, uh, but at the same time there is a threshold where um, we understand that our audience um, has an ac acceptance level, uh, that they have also, um, when they enter this space, they kind of say yes to us, so we really have to be careful about what content we curate to them, uh, and that it, it does appeal to a wide variety of taste and is not offensive to the visitors or that community. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a lot of thought put into that. It must get difficult at times. <laughs> <laughs> it, it gets difficult, like our conflict is where we, we do want to say, hey, we're all inclusive to a wide variety of artists, but then at the same time, uh, kind of to Josh's point, if I do build a digital experience and somebody is going to get, get violent in that experience, I might stay away from it as a curator. Yeah. Mm. So Jesse, do you advise <laughs> people starting up new operations that they need to be con thinking about the ethics involved with their business? Absolutely, and so I think you know, it's, it's an important conversation. And as we all know, it's gotten more and more important when we think about diversity and inclusion. And so I spend a lot of time meeting with companies and just trying to understand the work that they're doing. So fostering that conversation. And, you know, who are the people actually behind the companies as well? So we've also seen an increase in VPs of DNI, which we didn't have before. You know, I've been in San Francisco over 20 years. And so now, you know, from a startup to, uh, you know, uh, big tech company, you have these VPs of DNI that are being hired as well as managers. And, and sorry, I'm, I'm ignorant and perhaps someone else is too. What's DNI? Oh, diversity and inclusion. Okay, thank you. My apologies. <laughs> and, so, and so my work is more on the ground and understanding who they are, what's the work that they're doing. Is there a representation of diverse voices at the table? Mm -hmm. So for example, with the case of Microsoft and Josh's team, you know, what does that team look like, right? And is there a representation from many spectrums of life, they're present and doing the work. And if not, how do we incorporate talent? Because we know that we do have diverse talent that can be part of that conversation, can do that work. And so that's where most of my time is spent. And then helping those that are, are doing the work and creating apps and so forth, that um, they're making their, themselves be seen, mm -hmm. so being able to show up, right? So we step back and think about this conference you know, what are the demographics around uh, diversity overall? What do those numbers look like? And so making sure that we show up and that we're holding people accountable, so our own communities as well, because we know that people do want to help and do want to provide the support and resources, but they have to be present. Right. So Robin, you, you explained to me that you're actually using technology to 
encourage awareness of some of these issues. Tell us a little bit about that work. Uh, sure, so we put people, we use virtual reality to start. Uh, we have different demographic tracks and it's literally putting you in the position, first person position of someone from a given demographic track and just what that, it's just, you know, basically living the experience of someone else, sort of key highlights of that. And um, it, we've had, we do research on everything because the first order of business is do no harm and the second order is do good. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not doing harm and that we're doing good. And uh, we've had great results so far. Um, but the idea is to, you, the feedback we've gotten, so we put guys in the headset and they, are, they sort of experience typical scenes for white women in particular, but women in general in the workplace. And when they, we, I could talk about the data offline later, but one of the comments they say is they thought they understood, but now they know they didn't. And th you know, again, that's I think one of the really powerful things that VR can do is, or AR, I mean, you know, any kind of immersive world mm -hmm. can do, uh, but I think there's the ethical obligation about that, which is, what does it mean to put someone <laughs> in someone else's shoes? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's a good thing, but that's my vantage point, and other people may not, and other people may be resentful of being put in someone else's shoes. And I, I'm gonna throw this out there because I think about this a lot. Um, who here has ever played a first-person shooter game? <laughs> okay. Who here has ever played a first-person shooter game in VR? Okay. Um, so, Pretty soon we'll have smellorama, I'm sure, to go with VR. So we'll, you know, get that metallic tang. And of course, there are haptic suits here for the recoil. And we know from a lot of brain imaging with VR that your brain has registers. Re your brain registers you shoot someone, that you've killed someone. Okay. Now you're a juror on a murder trial. We have no idea how your pleasure at killing someone virtually will affect your vote, but it's probably going to. I mean, so all of these experiences that people are having are affecting us IRL, and we have no idea. Um, so that's just something I think a lot about ethically, about what, what is the IRL implication as our brains are, will soon be flooded with experiences we wouldn't otherwise have in real life. And that's, a, that's a fabulous segue for the question I wanted to bring back to Josh, which was, uh, a few weeks ago, Microsoft was in the news for a contract to sell a ton of HoloLenses to the Army. And some folks at Microsoft got pretty upset about that. Um, how, how did that come down? I mean, did you, was there an ethical discussion before the decision was made? Um, and and how, how did that feel to be close to that? That's a great question. Uh, let's see. Yes, there were a number of ethical conversations that went on. Um, we've heard uh, Satya and Brad Smith uh, both uh, speak publicly about the nature of being a country operating in the United States. Um, and so the relationship um, that you have with a country, uh, they're saying, hey, we operate within the bounds of this country, and so uh, there would need to be uh, there needs to be an openness or a transparency about um, the support that uh, goes into, you know, the, the defense of that country. Now, it's a fascinating and, like, thoroughly gray area because uh, we look at it uh, from our team's vantage point as what is, the, um, what is the type of consent or will that goes into the individuals, the Microsoft employees or the people that have contributed to Microsoft technology, um, did they sign up for that? Um, a similar instance happened. I was at Google when, uh, when the Project Maven um, uh, counter response, or I would say big response, happened. And, and there's a different question there ethically. Maven, for those that don't know, is a military program around drone surveillance. And, um, and the, the big backlash there ethically uh, was twofold. It was, did the Google employees feel like they, again, signed up to do this, but also where did the data come from? Um, and I think a huge question across the board that I'm sure this panel all thinks about is, is where do we think about 
Um, the sources of the data, which we then eventually think about as just the sources of truth. Um, and how do we come to, gain to, to acquire those things? So in the context of military development, um, if it was sourced from the public, as it was from the Google, Google case, there was a big ethical boundary line. Unique to Microsoft is that all uh, that there are there are firm firewalls that exist between military, enterprise, and consumer, and those firewalls don't get crossed. Um, and furthermore, we uh, we specifically made it an internal uh, sort of mission statement or mandate that anyone that was going to work on this type of technology needed to opt in. Mm. So nobody was signed up against their will to work on this stuff. Um, and then it comes down to teams like mine. Um, to figure out where the boundary lines, the do not cross lines, uh, exist, because we have to figure it out in real time. Um, war is a reality, and there's a ton of existing literature and policy and precedent about um, you know, international humanitarian law and how we respect and uphold that and make sure that in the flurry of developing uh, emerging technologies, we don't just think we're out in a limb inventing something new. Like We're not. We have tons to draw from. So um, those big questions about uh, international humanitarian law and specifically you know, meaningful human control, which is the current uh, United States policy um, around autonomous weaponry, we look to uphold those things and make sure that we, are, we can all um, walk with accountability. Uh, whatever it is that we deliver uh, is something that was done intentionally and with boundaries um, and uh, with the ability to respond when the public asks and internally people ask about it. Yeah, I found that conversation extremely ironic because uh, you know, it may not be apparent at this point in time, but virtual reality was developed by NASA and the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the late 80s, those are the people that, that paid for all the experiments, the first head-mounted displays, the picture on the cover of my book is from NASA's work in 1988, uh, and, and, and now the, 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 the wheel has turned it seems like a completely civilian business, though it is, it is not. In fact, one of the largest users, uh, among the largest users are military organizations who do tremendous amounts of training in virtual environments. Uh, Jesse, do, do, do you run into people starting new businesses that are looking at, at virtual environments as uh, either part of their business um, product or part of their the tools they use to run their business? Is that common? Yeah, you know, for me, I think what I've seen is more companies that approach it from a social impact standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so what are those experiences that can be created to put someone in their sh someone else's shoes, right? You have that first po person point of view yeah. and to understand, you know, what is that experience like? What are the surroundings? You know, what are the actions that are being taken? And then also, um, I think for what's top of mind for me is just how do you, how do you create a, a better life for someone? So kind of that's the umbrella. And so it's more from a social good perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Selma, I know a lot of Meow Wolf's tech, uh, presentations are technologically involved. Are, are you finding that, that virtual technologies are, are having a big impact on what, what you all do? So that, that's uh, uh, interesting for us. Uh, we managed to build an immer immersive environment that's physical. So our current Santa Fe exhibit doesn't have any virtual reality or augmented reality uh, inside the exhibit. We do have an AR app uh, that's optional for people to purchase uh, at the moment. Um, and looking forward, we decided because the exhibit is so immersive to shy away from virtual reality uh, exhibit wide. So we are focusing on mixed reality and augmented reality in our future exhibits. We do think of virtual reality as an artistic tool. So when we do have open calls to artists, we are open to those proposals, but we're not thinking of it as a wide um, exhibit-wide uh, technology that we'll, we will utilize. Um, we do like the idea of augmented reality because it does keep people connected to uh, kind of the real environment. Um, it, and especially since it's a social and usually a group visit to Meow Wolf, people do want to be able to be able to track their family or group members. 
uh, and keep interacting. So we find that mixed reality is a really good fit for us. Um, how it will push that interaction within the exhibit, we're still learning, so I don't have uh, those answers. Uh, what we find is usually if the uh, interaction is familiar, for example, if we do a driving simulation or something that is very familiar to people, uh, they get more joy out of it. If we do something very weird where they have to spend some time learning, it's less fun for them. Um, and then most of our interactions are planned to be contained within the exhibit. Um, and, and the take home experiences would be very different from the exhibit and it would be more in line with what a traditional AR game maker would do. So you said the word tracking and that's one of the, the, the triggers that, mm -hmm. that people have as they address this technology in our research and, and we, we study the, the business uses of these technologies. One of the things that people are loving about virtual reality and augmented reality is eye tracking and the ability to tell what people are looking at and what, how long they look at it. And uh, you, know, you can almost read somebody's thoughts from, from what they look at and if their pupils dilate, that means they liked it. So Robin, you're probably real familiar with this stuff. Could you tell us a little bit about this and, and how you address the tracking and data issues? Sure, I actually think it's terrifying um, <laughs> because it's uh, an intrusion into pri personal privacy, um, emotional privacy, if you will. So there, you know, in the exhibit booth here, there are, air, there are companies, it's, it's a form of biofeedback, basically, to do eye tracking and the size of your pupil, and they may also have all kinds of other muscle sensors and things like that. So they can, using a lot of data, figure out what emotion you're experiencing based on which muscles on your face are being used. So when you're in a, and, and you can, you know, Oculus can come out with a new headset that has these sensors in it, and you might not, I mean, it, I'll advertise it, but you wouldn't really understand what that means. I mean, that's a whole other issue of what does it mean, what does informed consent really mean? Um, but they'll have all of this information from you that you really didn't know what you were giving them in the same way that we have a tiny version of this with the internet now, uh, or smartphones. Um, but this is on steroids because it's really your personal emo signature, your emotional signature, um, and I just think it's terrifying. So how, how do we safeguard that information? Jesse, it looks like you want to say yeah, something. Yeah, no, I was, I was <laughs> laughing because I just saw a demo this week on the future of retail. And so uh, you actually walk into a store and because of your uh, phone, right, if it's set on looking for Wi-Fi, and they have sensors that'll pick up the MAC address for your device and it'll follow you through the store, and then it'll follow you to a rack, and if you see a certain item that's tagged with RFID, then those, it, that you picked it up, and then they have cameras in the sky that then are looking at your face. Well, that's the Amazon Go store, right? What your reactions are doing, so Minority Report. Yeah. 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 Yep, all over again, yep. and so it was, uh, you were wowed, but then it was creepy. Yeah. Right? And so they were trying to gauge that. Well, is it really creepy or not? <laughs> and I think it varied for everyone. I think it's super creepy, and um, <laughs> I think there's a there's a really interesting mismatch around the way that we talk about like emotion recognition and um, uh, people's like personal perceptions of their own uh, their own affect or their own experience. So like when we train machine learning models, all we can do is train machine learning models based on um, how we perceive the world, right? Like you would set up an individual, like the foundation of any affective uh, computing system is that there's a bunch of training data about people making certain faces uh, or they're hooked up to specific machines so that we can get certain physical responses when they're exposed to certain stimuli, um, all in a controlled situation. But it's all based on um, uh, the perception of the, of the researcher, of the product team about what emotion they perceive that person to be experiencing. So there's this like, there's this sense that we'll build these systems that can know us better than we know ourselves, but all they're really able to actually understand is how others might perceive our emotion, no, if that makes sense. Not for the facial muscles. There's actually cross, there's some very good data about the very specific muscles involved with particular expressions. So that one is much more universal. Right, but even that underlies the, the belief that there's something like a universal signature of like fear or a universal signature of joy. 
right. um, which is like a, a culturally questionable point. Again, like back to the question of right. DNI and who is involved in the room mm -hmm. while we're making those determinations right. and what kind of broad representation of, all, of people in context. So then these, these industries will sell this stuff and they're like, all right, now we know what emotions you're feeling. And what we, we see people doing is they believe it. You know, they'll walk by, Microsoft has this ability actually, and a number of companies have this ability to like have, a, have yourself in a webcam and it'll tell you what emotion you're feeling. And people are like, oh, I didn't know I was feeling that emotion. <laughs> and you're like, well. And then you feel it because that you were told that's exactly. what it is. That's how it works. Exactly. Yeah. So I was, I was even, yeah, just to, to, to sort of layer on this stuff, like this question of who gets to be in control of establishing what true is, mm -hmm. uh, is a huge position of power. Um, and then it goes back to how we market and sell this stuff and how we describe the capabilities of the technology. Well, as we saw in the, the fuss from the last election where the, the, the complaint was not that people's votes were stolen directly, but that they were influenced according to the interests that they had already exhibited. That's right. Uh, you know, leads right into this conversation. When you can uh, put someone into an immersive environment, um, the ability to manipulate their emotions and sensations is, is magnified tremendously, um, which is what show business and art is all about, isn't it? Selma, what do you think about that? Uh, I, I mean, to Robin's point, there's a lot of VR content that is trying to emote and get a reaction out of people. Um, I, I'm not saying that Meow Wolf is not going to commission in the future uh, an artist that can play with people's emotions based on the biometric data that a device outputs. Um, it's part of the fun of Meow Wolf. It's part of the interaction. Uh, it's going to be our job as our company to make sure that that's within um, consensual and, and clear guidelines when they do make that piece of artwork. But I, I, like from our perspective, um, I think there is a wow and a joy factor that can come out of some of these um, sensors that are on these devices and there are ways we can play with them in a very delightful way. And, and, and then, yeah, there's lines that we need to draw in the sand and be like, you can't cross this as an artist. We're not going to show your piece mm -hmm. if you do this. Mm -hmm. So what about, what about data collection and retention? I mean, we now have, you know, with this technology and, and the, the, the biosensors that can be built into head-mounted displays, the ability to, to collect vastly more and more sophisticated, more subtle, uh, nuanced data. Uh, Josh, does Microsoft have a position on this? Well, impossible for me to speak for the entirety of the company, I, yeah. but I will, uh, I will <laughs> say like we are, um, we're working on developing best practices. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, a, like the meta point there is that like a lot of times the, the regulatory precedent or the policy that's being written is done so in sort of like a theoretical space or an academic context. Mm -hmm. um, and so the challenge is to cross that bridge and say like when we're doing this in the context of a product where there's totally different incentive models and you know like speed and time to market and the traditional engagement metrics are so prominent, um, how, do we, how do we find a balance? So our, our emerging approach um, and this is still kind of in the research phase, but we're doing it in concert with a few product teams, is really flipping the model around understanding what people need. I know it sounds common sense. Like as a designer, sometimes I wander around feeling like it's mostly just a path back to common sense, but it's not a question of like if I think I've uh, obtained meaningful consent, it's whether I can actually, uh, the individual whose data is being uh, requested um, has been empowered to give me the message that they've consented. Mm -hmm. That means that they've, they feel they can represent that there's been a meaningful disclosure of what types of data, that they felt it was voluntary, that they felt like they had a real opportunity to accept or decline, which means the service has to be cap like functional in the absence of the person giving up their personal data. And so when we start from this binary you know, position as products where we say like, give me your data or you can't use the service, that's not a real choice. 
You know, so it puts the it puts the onus back on these big companies to say, actually, let's design in such a way that it's possible to get benefit, and let's prove that we're trustworthy with your data and that the benefit is real and tangible, so that you can decide when the time is right for you, what type of data, and then you have control to delete it all and control it and bring it back. Um, and, w and one of the questions that comes up when you talk about uh, consent, informed consent is whether the people really understand what you're asking for. Robin, what do you, th you, no, you, you deal with that? designed <laughs> so they to obfuscate the, what you're consenting to. That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I j on your point sort of is a bridge. I have a bunch of different headsets, uh, brands, and every single one I actually have to log on. I cannot, even though I'm making my own content that I'm uploading from my computer, I cannot use the device if I don't log in with some identifying information and I, you know I, what's that about they don't i mean i get it if they, if i want to you know use my google drive to download something but it's you know it, was there an informed consent about how my information was going to be used right. absolutely not yeah and it it, it seems blatantly uh disadvantageous it'd be like having to log in to use your mouse or turn on your t your monitor yeah or your yeah. TV. Jesse, do you find that... Don't that give anybody any ideas. That's <laughs> a matter of time. Do you find that business startups are, are thinking about data retention issues and, and what they can do with the data they might collect from their uh, customers? You know, I think it, it comes back to the entrepreneur and the work that they're doing. And so I think of the level of sophistication, right, of the entrepreneur and data and privacy. And yes, you know, we're hearing it more and more and there's more... Uh, safeguards being implemented, mm -hmm. but if the entrepreneur isn't well versed, then there's some areas where they might you know, miss the mark and may get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we have to ensure that you know we provide some type of guidance and ensure that they're they're also looking at other like companies to see what they're doing. So in the old dot com days, you know it was like, oh, you need a privacy policy. You do a quick search for someone else's, maybe copy it and <laughs> change a few words. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. so, you know, bury it below the fold. <laughs> yeah, right. It's all good. Exactly. But now, um, again, it's, it goes back to just the level of sophistication for the entrepreneur, which is also the consumer. So I think about, you know, what the two of you are saying is like, how many personas is that? So when you think of the level and the scale right. of very well informed and verse right. to, I have no idea. Right. And then I think about uh, just diverse communities in general. It's like, do they even know what to ask sometimes? Right. right. You know, as a consumer. Right. We've had rules for a long time about whether or not children could give consent, but now we're starting to realize that men and women might have different attitudes about it. Different people of different cultural and ethnic backgrounds, different national backgrounds will have different ideas. You know, privacy is a very different concept in in many parts of Asia than it is in North America, for example. Yeah. Um, so we need to take all that stuff into account, I would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I have to go back to like how people feel. Yeah. You know, most, most of what we're seeing is a, a valuable, um, but expected for, for those of us on the inside, um, backlash where it's like, mm -hmm. I didn't realize I signed up for this, right? Like that, yeah. to your point, like they are totally, the incentive is, did, did you get um, uh, did you get somebody uh, you know signed up to your service? Uh, how frequently did they engage? Uh, did your compute resources go up and to the right so that you know people you can get your your valuation higher and so that you can get bought? So you know it's like this whole train down the line, um, and those incentives are misaligned with informed consent because ultimately manipulation is a far faster path towards uh, towards your numbers getting you know getting bigger. Right. Um, but, the, but then what we have to understand, and this is where I'm, I'm fascinated here on the kind of the entrepreneurial versus big tech firm side, the big tech firms, they kind of have to, like they're waking up to the realization that they'll be dead in the next four, five, six, seven years if they don't actually fundamentally change their approach because there will be a total absence of trust. You know, uh, the, the idea that People are like, well, I didn't sign up for Facebook to know that about me. Like, I didn't, I didn't realize that that's what Google knew about me. Or look at Wells Fargo, you know, the past <laughs> totally. couple of years. But yep. then the, the, the reinforcement is so much tighter at an entrepreneurial level. It's like, I'm just trying to get to my first million users so I can get my Series B. Yeah. 
how do, how do you uh, see that, that debate going on? Well, it's really more of a conversation that I don't want to know. And so, because an entrepreneur can take that risk and they can afford to get that slap on the hand or mm. you know, have a minor article written up, and then, but they still move on. At least that's what I've seen in the past. And so, um, they just have more leeway, which is one of the big tech companies. You know, I went to F8 this year and they open up with data, privacy, and so it's you know, front and center now. And you know, we are gonna protect the consumer, so they're going through this whole transformation, which... Maybe. Yeah, except today. Well, it's what their they response, say, right? Their legal response is, when, now that they're being sued about it, is a class action suit against Facebook. Right. They're saying Facebook users have no reasonable um, expectation of privacy. That's what the Facebook lawyers are saying in response. There's no reasonable expectation a person could have of privacy they shared publicly about their life. So they're saying this, but then there's just like. And when I, when I talk to, to young people, high school kids, the, the concept of privacy is completely different than my generation or, or, or the millennials even. Mm -hmm. uh, privacy, I believe, is a sort of an obsolete concept. We're in an age where there will be very little privacy. But I see, I, I think that's, they were raised to believe that by the big corporations. I mean. But is it not true? It, it is true because that's what the big corporations wanted. They mm -hmm. wanted people to feel comfortable sharing all of these details about their lives, and so these kids grew up that that's what they knew, and that's, I mean, to me, that's the regulatory piece, because companies are, are, why would they opt for less data rather than more? And, and, and so, that's a great point. Uh, you know, in the absence of regulation, Future generations will grow, grow up with probably even less privacy, as we have, you know, sensors and all kinds of other data tracking we don't have now. Yeah. But but it's just it's you know like why are there so many Superman movies? I mean, there or superhero movies. They're advertised everywhere, so that's what you go see. I mean, that's that's what there is. So that's the reinforcement. Yeah. 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 <laughs>